Good morning. Uh, you know, thanks. I always say this. Uh, it's really an amazing thing that whatever 150 people show up after some very long nights, uh, parties, lots of competing breakfast buffets up and down Collins Avenue. So it's always nice to see that there are people around this fair who are ready for a serious conversation about serious things. Not to say that what's happening back there is isn't serious. Very serious this year, particularly. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming. <coughs> I want to thank Absolute for being a presenting partner of this uh, talk series. Um, and especially, I want to thank our speakers, 75% of whom are with me on the stage. <laughs> Please uh, give them a round of applause in advance. Uh, thank you. And I, I think maybe today, uh, the whole uh, structure of the panel is a kind of performance piece. Uh, expressing the idea of museums going global. So you have the big Western museums uh, represented, and then uh, the fourth person coming from uh, Mexico City will join us. It will be a kind of new encounter between either uh, uh, the West and, and what is called the rest. So um, the proof of the relevance of our topic uh, is here with us uh, in the room and in Miami. Uh, there's an amazing diversity of people even here today, uh, certainly outside the doors uh, of this convention center. Um, uh, we all know, and we've been really uh, trying to respond to the fact that the art world is becoming uh, extremely global, along with society in general. And this has become uh, a major cause of concern, a major challenge, and a major opportunity uh, for museums. We are all born in different countries. We were all brought up with diff speaking different languages. I suspect there may be several other uh, nationalities just here uh, this morning. Museums uh, have certainly been waking up to this reality, uh, perhaps not quite as fast as some big consumer brands, which have globalized very rapidly. But museums, too, are uh, reimagining themselves, rearticulating uh, their relationship to the world. And in so doing, they're starting to do things a little bit differently. Uh, how they're doing things differently and what sort of challenges they're uh, encountering along the way is what we're here to talk about this morning. Um, <coughs> you all know this, but the reasons for going global are very clear. Uh, culture as we experience it today is not what it was 20, 30, 50 years ago. Our conceptions of art history are changing. Our conceptions of what is relevant, what we need to communicate to audiences is changing. Our idea of the narratives of art history is being decentered. Um, uh, there is perhaps uh, less of a privileged viewpoint in how we tell the story of art. Museums really have to uh, do a lot of figuring out to tell the story of art in a new way. Um, their visitors are changing. In some museums, especially the largest ones, including two of them here, a uh, very large share of the visiting in-person audience is now international. In some cases, the majority is now uh, international. And when it comes to the online audience, you're, of course, speaking to an extremely international audience base. Increasingly, donors are coming from outside of the home countries of institutions. That's certainly a fact that museums recognize. And at the same time, and I hope we'll get back to this today, the market, the market uh, behind me in the halls here, has globalized at tremendous speed. Uh, I would probably venture to say that the market has been quicker to engage the world in some ways than some museums have, and that's an interesting really? issue in itself. So uh, it falls upon uh, this generation of museum leaders to respond to this context, to come up with new programs, new ideas, new initiatives um, to uh, engage the world. And um, I wrote a little piece this morning in the art newspaper in which I proposed that we are now in a kind of new phase of uh, uh, global engagement for, for museums. Uh, it's a phase that comes on the heels of a lot of satellites and a, uh, sort of a, a, an earlier phase of outreach, but it's a new phase where museums are increasingly thinking uh, uh, in a more collaborative, in a more listening kind of mode to the rest of the world. And sitting here with me today, 
are three people who have been developing programs which are more sensitive, more collaborative, more willing uh, to allow in uh, different voices into the collections, into the expertise around the collections, uh, and they're all feeling their way. Um, not that this is easy. As a matter of fact, uh, this kind of global engagement is the hardest of all uh, to do. Um, it requires museums to actually change the way that they behave. There's a lot of learning to do, and there's a lot of unlearning to do. Um, uh, but it's a very, very exciting uh, time. So there's a lot of issues to cover, but what I'm going to do, and at some point, Patrick Sharpener will hopefully uh, join us. I mean, we know he's on his way. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll first sort of talk, ask each of our uh, wonderful guests to talk a little bit about how they sort of balance the local and the global uh, in their institutions. And they'll just get us started. And then we have a number of issues we'd like to circumnavigate. And I promise there'll be time for questions uh, toward the end. So does that sound OK to everybody so far? Fantastic. So I'll start with you, Alexandra, a great friend and colleague from New York, from the Guggenheim Museum. Alexandra, many of you know, it has presided over uh, some of the most ambitious uh, global initiatives at the Guggenheim, itself a museum well known for engaging the world very proactively. Uh, she's been highly influential in framing the Guggenheim's collecting strategy in the Middle East, but certainly primarily in her role uh, as the uh, uh, being responsible for Asian uh, initiatives at the Guggenheim. She set up an Asian council. She's a key figure in the UBS's fantastic map initiative as well. So she's been on the ramparts of this. So uh, Alexandra, say a few words about what is the biggest challenge in all of this for you and how do you come at this? How do you balance out the fact that you're a New York institution engaging the world? Well, I think all of our institutions, whether it's the Tate or whether it's MoMA or whether it's the Guggenheim Museum, we have long histories of internationalism. This is not a new language for our museums. It's not a new language for our curators. What's new is uh, it, the way it's being, as you say, articulated and imagined. Mm -hmm. I have a theory that American museums were extremely ambitious internationally in the post-war period. The Guggenheim certainly with its um, Guggenheim International Awards, a curator like Lawrence Alloway, a director like um, uh, 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 Sweeney, they were curating exhibitions and sending their people and their, their experts and curators to Egypt, to um, Iran, to Japan, um, to collect art and bring it to the Guggenheim Museum in a series of exhibitions that lasted well into the 70s. MoMA had many similar initiatives. I feel what happened in the 70s is a massive retrenchment mm -hmm. in the American mentality. I think it's the Vietnam War, I think it's the Iran hostage crisis, it's the oil shock, mm -hmm. um, and of course it's the rise of postmodern discourse and critical methodologies that also kind of shifted the way these discourses were being manifested and mm -hmm. demonstrated in the museums. Mm -hmm. And I think what um, happened in the 1980s in America in institutions, and I represent sort of East Coast, you know, museum establishment, is a is a retrenchment and a kind of almost a parochialism. Mm. But still, there was the memory. There still there was this sort of institutional DNA of international engagement, um, and I think this begins, as you say, to be rearticulated and reimagined in the 1990s, <coughs> with of course globalization. Globalization, cultural, political, economic, has obviously impacted us, as has the rise of certain academic critical discourses that our generation and younger generations of curators and academics are heir to where the where the sort of we articulate and we reimagine those discourses that are seeing the world in a radically different way. What is that radically different way? It's no longer binary. It's no longer hierarchical. It's no longer east-west, tradition modern, uh, past present. It is a network. It is a it is a network of simultaneous, dynamic, uh, uh, cosmopolitan hubs, and it's that image of art history. It's that. Uh, articulation or reimagine of art history that I think curators at the Guggenheim, especially those working in the Abu Dhabi project, um, the UBS project, are engaged with promoting. Mm -hmm. I feel very strongly that none of this is possible without scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, many museums are moving sort of laterally. I feel like we have 
three museums that are engaged in this, Andras, that you and I have discussed. It is the Asian art museums, like the Asia Society, Japan Society, the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. They're moving uh, chronologically from long entrenched programs of traditional art into the 20th and 21st century. That happened. I was there at the, at the mm -hmm. Japan Society when we pushed that forward. At museums like the Tate, Modern, the Guggenheim, we need to move uh, chrono geographically. We need to expand ourselves geographically. And the last sort of model that you're engaged with at the Met is how do encyclopedic museums engage with modern and contemporary Asian art, Middle Eastern art, African art. And I feel that model is the least imagined. It's the least articulated. Uh, and, and these, all of these programs, Andras, I feel and art have to be based on scholarship. It has to be, uh, it has to be based on real projects, real exhibitions, real scholarship, real programs. Yes, well, uh, all true, and I'll be interested to see how you, you all articulate this in your respective locations. In the end, though, it does boil down to a curator really studying parts of the world. You've used, we had a phone conversation, you used the very evocative term of helicopter curating at one point. You know, curators arrive. And tell, tell me what you mean by that and in this context. Why? I think I used airport curating. No, I think you used um, helicopters. Helicopters are pretty expensive. Um, uh, uh, airport curating. They crash. Okay. They crash. And they crash. And they crash. Yes. <laughs> more, more importantly, they crash. That could be spectacular and interesting. Um, by airport curating, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm a great fan of biennials. We have seen a huge proliferation of biennials around the world. They have served a very, very important function in this shift, in this tilt, in this uh, uh, new sort of globalized, more dynamic, more interesting uh, sense of the world, a uh, sense of how art making is made and where it's being made and by whom. Uh, but I think that it has, it's, it's guilty, it's prone to a very, um, uh, what Murakami would call a super flat uh, ideation of the world. And what you're missing in that is scholarship, you're missing regional understanding of local politics, local history, um, the, the, the use of even a, a medium like ink or a, a style like abstraction or conceptualism to its own local means. We need interpreters. We don't need airport curators. We need interpreters. All right, lesson number one, no airport curators, uh, please. Chris, uh, I don't need to uh, introduce you to this audience. Um, you've arrived with some uh, drama from uh, the Tate yesterday, um, where it's fair to say you have one of these museums, which is emblematic of a museum that has a profoundly international audience increasingly international self-awareness and mandate. And since you've been on the job, you've done, I think, a fairly thorough rethink about how, what does everything that Alexander just said mean for the tape? I, so, I think the audience wants to know what you mean with drama, right? I, I, I think mean, they all are really would love to, to know. It's yes. just an illustration of what Alexandra said. I mean, we travel too much, and since um, very friendly custom officers and police officers in Miami found out that I'm traveling regularly to Saudi, to the border with Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, the Congo. They decided to keep my passport. And I could not explain what it means, globalism, I mean, in art. So Did, anyway. did you invite so them to so, so that's the drama, okay? <laughs> it's not more than that. I mean, everybody has to learn, and we have to unlearn. So that's a good illustration of that. <laughs> uh, but what can I add to Alexandra? Maybe I should add the following. Mm -hmm. That is that instead of global integration, we have to be very careful. I think it's much better to speak about global differentiation. Yes. Because it's the interconnectedness of the world, the so-called global art, is an absolute illusion. We are not interconnected. We are completely different. What's happening in Saudi is very different from what's happening in, let's say, the Emirati. And what's happening in Kuwait City is again very different from what's happening in Riyadh or what's happening in Jeddah. And I can go on and on and on. And visual arts is ideal to speak about differentiation because visual arts today operates like a huge container. And everybody wants to participate. The fashion world, the economical world, the theoretical world, everybody's kind of welcome in that container. And of course, the fact 
that there is a kind of economical surplus that we all can make a little bit of money with a kind of completely deregulated models because in the visual arts world there are no regulations. We can be a curator, we can be a dealer, we can be a consultant. Visual arts is ideal to benefit from a kind of economical, new economical model and that makes it incredibly attractive for so many different centers in the world. That's number one. Differentiation not only in terms of these economics, in terms of the organization, but also, of course, differentiation in terms of um, what's going on in the world. When we speak about modernities, like the Centre Pompidou right now does in the New Displays, we, we have to speak about many different kinds of modernities. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have to really to learn is to listen to all these people that they have different art histories. There is not such a thing as a global art history. There Agreed. are many different art histories. And what we always forget, Alexandra, and that's the reason why I'm so glad that you pointed out the 50s, 60s, and 70s, that we think that suddenly we have come up with the global art yeah. uh, history of James Elkins. But there are many different art histories which have been written already since the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Suddenly, we start to discover what happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but what's now necessary is to go even back further and yeah. think about what happened in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So, no global integration. Are you all following? It's no, getting really complicated. No global art history, but many different modernities, many different histories. I just want to stress this whole idea of differentiation. And it makes it very, very difficult for museums, because then it's not enough mm -hmm. to make exhibitions with artworks coming from all over the world, then it's not enough to have acquisitions and even acquisitions committees collecting artworks from all over the world. We have to change something at the very basis, which is what I would like to call, with the words of Habermas, a cosmopolitan, or the words mm -hmm. of Ulrich Beck, a cosmopolitan methodology. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, and we don't have that methodology yet. What yeah. we try to do at Tate, besides making these different exhibitions and different uh, forms of displays and different forms of acquisitions is really try to create a new form of research where we collaborate. Because what we have to do is to unlearn <coughs> our Western perspective yeah. on these modernities. To give you one example, we speak about modernity as a fallout, as a surplus of the Industrial Revolution. We cannot speak about the Industrial Revolution in China and in Africa. We should speak about the so-called Industrious Revolution. What that would mean is that besides visual arts, we have to take much more serious things like arts and crafts. We have to take much more serious the development of ethnological museums because we think that we invented something, but if you go to ethnological museums, if you go to specialists of art and crafts, we can learn from them. But we have to give up that single idea of visual arts, that single idea from we are so happy, we are one world together. We have also to unlearn our world mm -hmm. of the history of art and visual arts. So there is a lot of work to do. And we'll, we'll get through it all in the next 35 minutes. We'll and just to add to, to that is we have also to think about new forms of interventions. Yeah. The museum as we know it, the Visual Arts Institute as, as we know it, is not apt to receive, right. to cap, to work with these new ideas and with this new spirit. So we have to talk about new forms of interventions. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. When I was interviewed for the job of Tate Modern, they asked me, do you want to franchise Tate Modern? And I believe I gave the only good answer, and that's why they hired me. I said, no way, Jose. I'm not going to franchise Tate Modern. We have to connect differently. We have to establish different networks. We are not going to build something in the desert in Abu Dhabi. Come on. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, okay. remind me to defend that. Okay. <laughs> Andras, give me a little no, platform no, I later. Think it's time. Because, because it, it, actually the Abu Dhabi project has turned out to be a fantastic <laughs> platform mm -hmm. for this experimental new art history, or I should say art histories. You mentioned yeah. a new story of mm -hmm. art. What we're looking at is multiple stories of art. Well, I want to get right and back. And it, it, it's actually yeah. a fascinating project. And Good right, answer. Right after we get just into this, I want to talk about... And it's changing <laughs> us. It's the periphery changing the center. Even better answer. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, the plot is thickening. So we have on the one hand this big world with which we're engaging. On the other hand, it's a kind of world of differences, as per Chris. On the other hand, one size doesn't fit all, and as Alexander has described, for each type of institution, we're talking about a very different trajectory, whether you're a, a Guggenheim or an encyclopedic museum or an Asia society. Uh, so this is, this is quite a ball of wax here. So, Chus, um, let's bring you into this. You're 
Ah, a round of applause to our fourth speaker. She's before me. Hello. <laughs> we have become, nice Hi. to see you, we have become fully uh, global here, Patrick Sharpenel, and, and it's great that you're here. You will have to sort of imagine what we've been talking about until now, but let us say, perhaps by way of summary, it's really complicated, this museums and global thing. Uh, and we were just about to ask Chus uh, uh, about how she balances the local and the global in her work. She, of course, uh, came off a recent experience from so sort of the mother of all global exhibitions, Documenta, where uh, she traveled the world to uh, create the, help create the last Documenta. And then more recently, she's been working as chief curator of the Almuz de Barrio in New York on Museum Mile, itself a complex institution uh, struggling to engage a New York constituency, a local New York, uh, a very specific community, but also a global community. So how, how do you resonate with some of the things so far, and what is your biggest challenge in your work? Well, I'm actually talking on behalf of a completely different... We have another yeah. microphone. Perhaps I can borrow yours? Please. Now what? Can I get another one? I'm talking on behalf of a completely different model. I think I've been always fascinated by um, institutions that um, they are of a different scale and nature, and they engage with the most complex thing to engage, which are the inhabitants of a city. Uh, those that are not in transit or trafficking um, an art institution, but they are living next to it, and they are the so-called community of that art institution. I'm working now at El Museo del Barrio, and uh, my uh, reason for accepting the job in New York has to do with my uh, first job, actually, which was in, um, in a space called Sala Recalde in Bilbao, when the Guggenheim was, uh, was kind of landing in, uh, in the city of Bilbao. When the big institution came, everyone was believing that the small institutions would disappear. And um, I'm a big believer of what I call the long tail museums, or the long tail institutions. Those institutions that are committed and engaging with contemporary art, that are international, but they are not global, if the global uh, is uh, naming a way of expanding and connecting and actually amplifying forces in an almost effortless uh, or, or big scale kind of thing. So um, uh, Bilbao teach me how important it was to create a cosmopolitan, and I resonate with Chris here, backstage, where you engage differently with that question of the global. First of all, what do we mean when we name global? We are talking about, I think, uh, in Documenta, for example, we refuse to use the word in any communication. So we just, uh, just uh, avoid it. And we try to understand something different than the global, which is exactly what Chris was talking about, a new way of connecting forces and starting differently in engaging with the art production and engaging with the nearness. So in Museo del Barrio, how can you be international cosmopolitan if you are not as well known and if you don't have the same means of resonating with international communities than others? Uh, by getting closer to yourself. I think there is a kind of very long-term and very scholar uh, job to do, which is, is to just, you know, uh, try to put together the pieces and go to the origin of institutions, try to understand how exactly can they engage with their own closer community, and by getting very, very, very close, you just open up to a new form of internationalism that is just by amplification. And it works by creating networks which are very particular and again, uh, reconnecting the texture not in an expansive way, but by locating and identifying alliances as small as you are and multiplying these alliances all through territories. Mm -hmm. One of the experiments we did in Documenta is to go to a place where the global or the contemporary makes no sense. Like when I was uh, working with Caroline Christoph Bakargiev, she just sent me to Kabul. So um, after two or three months in working by, for Documenta, which is happening in the city of Kassel in Germany every five years since 1955, uh, we decided that it's a, a nice thing to investigate that business of the global. It's a nice thing to investigate also that business of the contemporary. I think we call art contemporary, and that's actually not a given that all of the art produced today is contemporary art. 
So there is lots of art produced today that would not follow under the category contemporary. For example, if you go to Kabul, there is lots of people producing art today. And they are very engaged artist community. They are amazing, um, you know, fine arts university. But the references are much more based in ancient knowledge. They are uh, based in a modernity that never took uh, the same form as we are talking about. We cannot name the same aesthetics. We cannot name the same historical references. But they are producing art, undeniable that they are. Mm -hmm. So unless that you don't, but you don't recognize it in the same visual category as we, when you visit some of these global collections. So they don't, they don't have the same shape. Mm -hmm. But they are art. Yeah. So how to understand that? You need to dismiss it or you need to include it? I think that we need to include it. And I think that institutions like Museo del Barrio or these kind of uh, proliferating small-scale institutions do help us to create a very necessary backstage for those other big large-scale institutions mm -hmm. to understand exactly how to engage in understanding things that we don't understand yet. That they don't look yet international, but they are relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that's a perfect segue to you, Patrick. I mean, uh, uh, everything that Chus just says, rep, uh, I, I'll go on, so hold on to that one. Everything that she just says must have been in your head in the last few months. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Patrick Sharpner has just come off, what, last week, opening the Humex collection? Almost three weeks ago. Three weeks. It feels just <laughs> like last week. Three weeks ago, what, this wonderful new Chipperfield building in Mexico City filled with a very internationally motivated uh, uh, collection, um, but you had the challenge of articulating a museum uh, that, that is rooted in Mexico City, but is clearly engaging the world. So how do you balance that? Yes, I don't know if it's the volume. Can we hear? This we is hear microphone you. working. Okay. Um, yes, uh, being a museum that is uh, just opened in based in Mexico City. It has a lot of impl implications. Uh, we understand that uh, Fundación Jumex is an institution that opened 12 years ago that has kind of an international projection, but is, that is based in Mexico, so we have to deal with the uh, economical, social, and cultural implications of being there. So that's why, for example, in the collection, we have feel a big, big affinity with artists that are producing in other regions of the world, like Middle East, for example, where they're totally, totally different, but they're produce, producing in similar conditions in the terms of becoming like emerging economies, but at the same time have a kind of marginality mm -hmm. in relation to the discussions that are happening in, in the biggest economical and political uh, world centers. So. Uh, opening now because we, we used to have a very, not a small, but a, a gallery that was inside the, the factory outside the city. And we got uh, only 2,000 visitors for exhibition, so it, it was far away and it was difficult to, to get people. Uh, so now that we open in a, inside Mexico City in a very well communicated area of the city, uh, we are getting the weekends almost 4,000 people, only the weekends. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different situation. And, um, but uh, for us, it's really, really, really important now that we are building a new program. It's very important mainly to be um, working and understanding the needs of a, a region, a region like Latin America, like Mexico. And um, uh, so, yes. Uh, so who do, you, who do you look to as your models in this? I mean, if you look out, I'm sure it's, You've been looking and you've been a student of other institutions around the world. Who do you feel has sort of cracked that challenge? And what were some of the models you were looking at as you were articulating this? Um, I have insisted in different occasions that I very much inspire in the idea of a university. Mm -hmm. In terms of university are platforms where you do education, research, but mainly also they become platforms, political platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, what does it mean, if we take this example, what does it mean to be a, a kind of university based in Mexico? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Mexico has been lately uh, facing the growing part of the economy in Mexico now is drugs. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So um, this this kind of we have now the biggest drug organizations in the world, El Cartel del Pacifico, and there is an, like a new culture that's growing on at the, in a parallel way. There is a new system growing up really quickly in our country. So these kinds of, of, of situations become very challenging when you're trying to, to build a program and understand because this is local, but this also has an inter international impact. Yes. So this is the kind of, of, that's why a lot of artists, interesting artists in Mexico, like Teresa Margolles, is dealing, or Francis Alice or many others, Abraham mm -hmm. Cruz Villegas are dealing in very intelligently with this kind of, of, of mm -hmm. things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, lots of themes have emerged, uh, you know, from how do you relate to your local audience to how do you relate to a multiplicity of definitions of what art is to how do you bring forward a kind of tradition of uh, internationalism into this sort of global age to really having to rethink the core models of museums. So there's a lot on the table, but I'd like to just spotlight a few of the issues. And I really would like to start with collecting because at the end of the day, Although Chris has been known to say on this stage that maybe we shouldn't be collecting as much, but uh, at the end of the day, the name of the, the name of the game in museums is the collection. And I'd like to come back to the little exchange you just had, particularly with reference to Abu Dhabi, but also now with your Asian program uh, at the Guggenheim. How are you approaching the cardinal issue of collections differently today than before? This is something I think about all the time, Andras. And you asked, uh, in preparation for this talk, what is the most challenging issue that we face? The Guggenheim has been, I think, incredibly successful. Uh, and certainly, they've given me and our team a lot of real estate in terms of presenting uh, exhibitions. We've had 12 exhibitions with catalog over uh, Deutsche Guggenheim in New York, Bilbao, over the last six years. That, 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 that's a lot of programming uh, of, I think, very exciting shows that have had a real impact on the field, the academic and curatorial practice mm -hmm. of how to integrate, how to contextualize, how to differentiate, how to curate difference within the context, the given Guggenheim context of being a Eurocentric international museum of modern and contemporary art. Mm -hmm. I gave each one of those three kind of categories of museums that are now dealing with this in the Western world. But I think it's not just each category. Each museum, each institution has its own DNA, has its own location, has its own history, has its own whims and strengths and weaknesses. Some, like MoMA again, are encyclopedic. Some, like the Guggenheim, have a relatively small and narrow collection that is built around abstraction and conceptualism and art of the now. So I think when we collect as responsible curators engaged in this challenge, in trying to push and trying to subvert and trying to re-articulate and reimagine the trajectory of our institutions, we have to respect who we are, who the institution is, because I don't want to collect things and have them go like things that came in in the 50s and 60s into a silo and never be seen or heard of again. I want to ensure that the objects and the artists and the stories that we're bringing in remain part of an active platform. So, so as but how do you said. actually do that? Uh, you do that by engaging experts. For, let me take the UBS model. Um, uh, the UBS uh, model is we have a, a identified South and Southeast Asia as an area, a regional area where we, that we want to bring into the larger story of the Guggenheim Museum. We have identified Middle East and North Africa, and we've identified Latin America. Each one of these will be headed by a guest curator, a curator in residence, Jun Yap from Singapore, South and Southeast Asia, Pedro de Leon is now working on Latin America and will be doing, they come into the Guggenheim, they identify works of art, it's an impossible challenge, and those objects that are then shown in some kind of narrative story with some discourse with a very active online and educational element will then enter the Guggenheim's collection. Mm -hmm. Not as a collection of Latin American art, but as a collection that has to recreate stories with our existing collection. So, so you had to kind of rewire the system of acquisitions and curation. So uh, 
maybe Chris, so how, how are you actually... Can I just add one thing? Arjun Apuradai calls it to interrogate. We're bringing in these works, these stories, these other narratives uh, to interrogate our our sort of existential identity as a museum. Yeah. Not to topple it, because that, not to completely unend it, upend it, to interrogate, and therefore change us. Yes. I think you misunderstood me, because I never said that collecting uh, these different worlds, these different works of art is not important, but I said that mm -hmm. it's, not enough. it's not enough. It's not enough to make exhibitions of uh, whatever South Korean yeah. modernism. It's not enough to have uh, Brazilian modernism of the 50s and to look into what happened between an uh, African artist uh, Mankoba and Asker Jorn in Denmark. You really have to think about why you want to do this mm -hmm. and how you want to do this. And then I think at some point you have a strategy and you can start to plug in. Plug in yeah. with exhibitions, plug in with collections. And at the same time what I also try to say is to create new forms of interventions. Now the methodology and the new forms of interventions that's a space where you can collaborate. Because it's impossible that Alessandra Munro or Jus Martinez or Patrick or me, that we know everything what's going on. It's absolutely impossible. Exactly. So you have to work with specialists. <coughs> yeah. You have to work with specialists who have been there before. And what I really like what uh, Alexandra was saying is there has been so much work done before all of you and before us. We simply seem to forget that. I mean, if you want to read about new internationalism, there are four books by Kobina Mercer, published in 1994, uh, between 94 and 1998, which is an absolute Bible. So we don't invent the wheel, and there is stuff done before that in the 70s and the 60s. We have to be really careful. Also, we have to understand what happened, because there was a lot of contact. There was a lot of contact history. There was a lot of art historical context, but suddenly, because of the oil crisis, because of everything else, we forgot about it. The universal festivals, the art festivals of Alger, of Dakar, <coughs> they have been existing. There is still some kind of residue. We just have to waken it up. Right, so I want to just ask you guys as well, what are museums doing differently today? I mean, I'm super practical. I, mean, I think we we'll understand the why, but it's the how that's so Sorry, interesting. I can come back to that too. Um, like, but you're talking in terms of collection? Collections, you know. Well, our case is um, different and I think very complementary to what uh, the other speakers are saying. It's a very, like, Museo del Barrio is the only museum I know in the world that has been founded by an artist, Rafael Montañez Ortiz. And, um, and actually, he declared El Museo uh, an artwork of himself. So this collection that has over 7,000 objects is the collection inside an artwork of an artist. That by understanding the peculiarity of the origin of a collection, you also understand the logic that this collection may follow. And that's really important. A collection is not a way of standardizing the criteria, but it's a way of sophisticating them and try to find your own script. So every collection yeah. needs to have a unique script. Yeah. Only in that sense, you are really um, enhancing uh, the world view. Because actually, when you name globalism, you are naming the possibility of having a, glo a global view, a, a view of an understanding of the world. So um, the case of Museo del Barrio is particularly sophisticated and beautiful. I think it's a collection that is not having any historiographical criteria. It's a collection, a collection that is built by an accumulation, and we can also say by a particular accumulation of emotions and works. Uh, these emotions are related to a community, the Caribbean, and also the diaspora of the Caribbean in the United States and now expanding to Latin America. So what is this collection telling us? This collection is telling us that we need to look close at many art practices, like for example the amazing work of Rafael Montañez Ortiz, and locating Rafael Montañez Ortiz somewhere else. Who could be Rafael Montañez somewhere else? Then you can look at John Downey, for example, in Chile, New York. Uh, you can also uh, try to connect Pedro Pietri, which is like an amazing part of our collection, which was a concrete poet and a poet, an amazing literary person uh, living in New York, and see if Federico Manuel Peralta Ramos, for example, in Argentina, was doing something similar. So the collection is teaching us to do a different scholar research on practices that sometimes get completely 
completely overseen, thanks God, by the market, mm -hmm. and also uh, by other institutions. So <coughs> we are actually right in our history. So it's another example of the one size doesn't fit all. Uh, I just want to move on to another aspect of this. As uh, Claudio mentioned, we're at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, we're organizing a colloquium of museum directors from around the world. And it's been a really fascinating process talking to some of the directors really from all over the world who are going to be coming. We gave them a sort of a questionnaire of what are the things that are greatest concerns to them. Perhaps not surprisingly, one of the big issues, how do you actually attract a, a larger public to, to a museum? Um, the other is, how do you attract funders to a museum? So I want to feed that question back to you guys. As you diversify your approach to museum programming and collections, how do you, are you having an easy time having the public come along for the ride? And are you having an easy time having funders come along for the ride? Or yeah, I not, mean, you, no. you have to make sure when you speak about differentiation and diversification that you also expect and accept and respect that there are many different kinds of public. Mm -hmm. When we did Salou Arou de Chouquer, the Lebanese sculptor of 90 years old, the public for her work was completely different than the public for Mesha Kaba. We bought this, the Museum of African Contemporary Art of Mesha Kaba, which is a huge piece, which is about nine rooms, and that public was completely different from the public for Salou, Salou Arou de Chouquer. As there is no global art, there is not a public which is interested in this kind of fake universalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you have to tell it with respect for the public. When you put on Shakespeare by an Indian um, director in London, then you have amazing crowds of Indian people because they read in this Indian translation of Hamlet something completely different than the other crowds. That makes it incredibly interesting. So you have to respect diversification in the audience and also in terms of the funding. London is a typical city where there are so many, I'm not calling it people from the diaspora, I don't even call them financial refugees, mm -hmm. I mean uh, people who evade taxes, I would call them uh, Afropolitans for instance. Mm -hmm. This is a new generation uh, of people, young people, they are absolutely uh, well educated, they are well off and they travel back and forth, and that's very interesting today. They live in Lagos, but they also go to Paris, they also go to London, they do different kinds of things in these different kinds of cities, and the same is true for people from Mali for different reasons. And these Afropolitanisms, this Afropolitans is even a, you know, a different kind of funding and working together. So you have to adapt your models to these very different social geographies. And this whole idea of the benefactor who goes with you to Africa on the Congo River and discovers all kinds of contemporary art like we used to do with Jean-Hubert Martin, with uh, Magicien de la Terre, I think that was, that's over. I'm not saying it was a big mistake, but uh, our process in dealing with these issues was delayed by Magicien de la Terre for at least 10 years because we looked for yeah. the complete wrong stuff. It was fun, right. everybody was happy, there was a lot of bonanza and sh shamanistic things going on but we looked for the, for the wrong things. And we have to repair right now. Because so that's another re-articulation mm -hmm. right. with mm -hmm. the donors. Are you, mm -hmm. well, obviously, you've had great success at the Guggenheim attracting interest in, 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 in this evolution of the museum. Well, it, it hasn't come easily. I mean, at the Guggenheim Museum, you know, you have to start with conviction and passion. Um, and as I've said earlier, well, you we know, have plenty of that in all, all I, of our I, I'm kind of a self-described you know, sub <laughs> subversive. Um, but the Guggenheim knew what they were getting into when they hired me, and it was at a point when we were also beginning to develop the Abu Dhabi project. The Guggenheim had defined itself as a global institution under Tom Cren simply by nature of the Bilbao uh, venue, the uh, Venice venue, and Abu Dhabi underway, and uh, the, the Berlin venue, which of course is very small, but a very interesting experimental place where we commissioned artists. It became a real site of art production that sometimes get uh, overseen. But I would not have been successful, Andras, as you know, mm -hmm. in my subversion, um, in, in, in demonstrating this conviction of, of a kind of new model of art history, a new laboratory, a new kind of curatorial laboratory, 
if I had not been successful in bringing in funders and coming up with specific initiatives. We call them at the Guggenheim Initiatives. They are, many of them, short-lived. They're five years, they're three years. They're well-funded, and they bring with it expertise and networks from around the world. I completely agree with Chris that we cannot do this alone. The, 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 the hubris that any curator, whether they're of color or not, can define a whole continent or a whole 50 years of history is ludicrous. Um, uh, what we need is conversations, what we need is dialogue, what we need is collaboration, and it's not enough to affect our own institutions. I totally measure the success of our exhibitions and of our collection strategy if we're also having conversations and effects in, in Vietnam, in Bangkok, in China, um, which we are. Um, and uh, so I feel that we've been lucky at the Guggenheim with specific initiatives, the UBS initiative, the Ho Family Foundation initiative, now focused on Chinese art and commission-based projects with um, select Chinese artists to expand the discourse of contemporary Chinese art. But I think it always has to circle back within the context, the given context of our own institutions. And there are limits to those contexts, and there are frustrations with those contexts. But if we're going to be successful, we have to negotiate um, the, the language within that institution and hopefully have impact and a, a spark a lively uh, conversation outside our walls and indeed into the world. And we cannot collect everything. We really yes. have to be very we careful be very and look selective. for transformative pieces. I mean, yeah. we rather buy three pieces mm -hmm. on a year basis than going to shop and buy 25 to 40. I mean, that's... that's that Just you wanted over. to jump in as well. No, I think that we need to move from an economy of audiences um, to an ecology of audiences. And that's the most challenging thing, at least for me, uh, how to think about an ecology of audiences. It means to combine audiences of a very different origin and of very different interest. So first of all, how to engage differently and better with those which are inhabiting the city, which are completely local and completely international at the same time. And on the other hand, how to combine these differences into producing that ecology that, that is reunited in the institution. How do you do that? Uh, trust. The most important, the key word for me is trust. I think you cannot actually deliver uh, following the expectations that you think your audiences, with plural, may have. You need actually to pick them up, as the Germans say, where they are, and try to bring them in, in, um, in your own project, and make them participate in that. That's a very difficult long term. This is not happening by marketing only. It's actually education, and that's why in the last 10 years everyone is talking about education, but also not education understood as pedagogy or understood as some kind of paternalism that is instructed by the institution but as a way of creating new tools of relating so these new forms of relating new languages <coughs> new ways of amplifying also the interest of the audiences inside and resonating with them inside the institution is the big challenge for me I, I love this term ecology of audiences Patrick you had a thought yes I was thinking that um uh, it's very important how the institution, because I believe that uh, cultural institutions are social institutions, and it's very important to see how you build a program. I was just thinking an example. We, we are presenting in the old gallery in Ecatepec an exhibition right now of Superflex, and a lot of the works that are activated outside the exhibition space. And just to give you an example, there is a piece that we are trying to bring to, to mass production uh, that uh, is a, a tool that uh, works, makes energy, uh, electric energy and gas energy in, in, in rural areas where there is not electricity. And, um, and well, uh, it, it, it works with organic, uh, or organic material. But the thing of a, of a project like this, and also, obviously we also introduce pirate products in, in Tepito. Tepito is like a paradise of, of private, uh, pirate economy. And, uh, for, and it's not because we don't want to just take pieces that function in, in, uh, in the city or in different uh, social contexts, but it's that uh, we really care about uh, experimenting and putting um, uh, in function different kind of pieces that uh, where, where as an institution we learn. So, uh, with this idea of uh, uh, doing an audience uh, ecology, ecology, I think um, 
at, at least in, in Fundación Jumex, we are all, always thinking we are doing a very crazy and ambitious project with Gustav Metzger. We will be do, doing pavilions all around the world. <laughs> it's, it's a, it will take time. But all around the world where we will be dealing with extinction. Mm -hmm. So for us, thinking the institution this way, where you don't, not only would deal with emotion, but also with knowledge, is, is really important. I'm really happy with Pat Patrick and who's are saying, because this new cosmopolitan methodology, what you describe, whereby this local uh, aspect is very important, will also enable us and force us to change our own policies in terms of our, not only our canons, but also in terms of what we are doing with so-called Western art. Because what you're yeah. describing is a process where the producers are as important as, as yeah. recipients and vice versa. What you're describing mm -hmm. is that water issues, that issues of energy are as important as making these objects, yes. objects which are for sale, which can be exchanged. So maybe the fact that we are rewriting this so-called cosmopolitan mm -hmm. behaviorism in terms mm -hmm. of aestheticism, in terms of making things, will change also our views and we will take other things seriously which we have been leaving out so far. Mm -hmm. And that makes it truly exciting. So mm -hmm. probably we can learn from this in order to change our own yeah. museum in our departments in order to change our organization. Right. Because I think the future of the museum is not making new buildings. No. It's not franchising. It's to think about the organization of your institution and maybe that's maybe something which can create a big help as well. And so that's the reason why I talk about new forms of intervention as a real form of exchange. It's right. not us to them, but it's really like a kind of, let's yeah. do something new uh, together. Uh, as Juan well, Ignacio, I'm oh, sorry, I just want to go, go, go. So, Sorry, I just want to return, because I think in this day and age we can't speak about audience without engaging and um, acknowledging online audiences. Yeah. Um, the Guggenheim has, New York has one million visitors. Uh, we have five million online visitors. And many of the initiatives that we're developing, these sort of so-called global art initiatives, I hate the term too, uh, for lack of better terminology, all have very robust funding for online interventions for uh, workshops in Bangkok, workshops in Ho Chi Minh City, for workshops in Singapore that are uh, you know, uh, a, a broadcast live, blogging sites, uh, all kinds of local critics, artists, uh, activists who are engaging in the conversation online. This is very, very important. I don't think we can you know, uh, measure uh, an audience these days only in terms of who comes in the door. But to answer your question about the Asian art programming, our shows have been as popular or more than any other contemporary mm -hmm. programming. That's the Tsai okay. show was the best attended show of contemporary art until Terrell. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> a, a quick check. Who has a question? Just so that I know, because in a few minutes uh, we'll do a few questions. Okay, not too many. Fine. So, um, uh, and we'll be wrapping up not too long from now. So, uh, e ecology is the word of the day. I actually love that. It's a new ecology of audiences. It's a new ecology of art. It's a new internal ecology for the museum of how you go about being a museum. But there's one piece of this ecology that I think needs to be addressed. It's the one that's sitting right behind me. It's the market, uh, which has been highly proactive in engaging other parts of the world. Um, do you feel the market is leading or following in this process? Do you feel museums are leading or following? How do you relate, to you, how do you define your activities in this sort of, uh, sorry to use the word, global situation in relation to what the market is up to? The market is not leading nor following. The, it's, a, it's becoming a parallel world. And I rather speak together with people like Okmi and Wazer about, you know, we are facing a big divide. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that uh, we are completely going to divorce from one another, but in terms of this new ecology, I think it's more and more parallel worlds. Mm -hmm. Do you all, do you all feel thing. this way? Or? Well, I think that the 90s was defining everything in terms of antagonism. And it's these dialectics of antagonism did not went very far, I think. So, yeah, parallel world perhaps, but I think that it's part of... of uh, 
of a system, and it's one part of it, a very, impo very important part of it, and you need to know how to negotiate with that, and nobody is an enemy. Uh, you know, I think you, you can just not think like that. We need to, uh, you need to navigate mm -hmm. with all the players, and the market is a player. Mm -hmm. But I mean, with due respect, uh, Chris, it seems to me that collectors are very actively uh, going out and discovering works and are as, uh, are as uh, active as curators in, in not just airport curating, not just airport collecting, uh, but really uh, traveling the world. And many of these same collectors, of course, are on your boards and advisory committees. So, I mean, is it really such a parallel universe? I mean, I don't know of many collectors who are traveling to Lubumbashi. I don't know of many private collectors who are uh, going to Timbuktu. I mean, we do that, but collectors don't do that. I mean, I, you know, it's, 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 let's not be too romantic. Yeah. I mean, it's like... <laughs> Patrick, you're I, with I, I agree, I agree that the, par the market is part of the system, but the problem is when the market gets too big and the collectors get too powerful and the galleries get too powerful, then they begin defining the program on institutions. Yeah, from, but there's always ways, I think, you know, we are talking as if you need to say yes, but there is another word, which is no. And I don't know of many collections traveling to Harlem either, so, you know, and that's, that's also, there is many localities and many, many things that need to be discovered, and they demand something that Chris is talking about, it's called risk, yes. Uh, because uh, some uh, players in the system are becoming really powerful, you need to take risks. It's true, let's face it. I think we also, when we talk about the market, we need to distinguish between uh, fabulous dealers who can be extremely adventurous and even scholarly and have resources to engage sometimes the best advisors to uh, uh, explore their sort of international aspirations and the auction. And I think uh, the auction, in, certainly in the case of contemporary Chinese art, has had a very pernicious effect and really basically destroyed an entire generation for a number of complicated reasons, which are too complex to get into now. Uh, and the Ho Family Foundation Initiative at the Guggenheim is designed in part by commissioning artworks to completely side skirt the market. We are not going out to buy works. We're working directly with the artist studios in part, deliberately, to avoid that whole problem. And I'm very glad you brought that up because actually that was the last particular question I wanted to raise, which is, it's a wonderful thing to go to Timbuktu. It's a wonderful thing to engage the world, but you're also I interacting with local cultural ecologies. Um, not to romanticize this issue, but surely that contact has consequences. The, what you just described with the auction houses is quite a profound consequence. How do you make this a, a good balance? Do you find, is there any, any watch out or cause for concern that as big Western institutions, collectors come into these local uh, contexts, it, it could have, is there any blowback? Is there any, are there any bad feelings? What, what, what the auction houses, for instance, present with every respect in the Middle East, uh, the involvement of auction houses in the Jeddah Art Week, for instance, or what the auction houses are doing in India, it's one thing, we are doing it quite differently. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it is completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's also different because I don't think that it's a healthy thing what auction houses are trying to do in the Middle East. I mean, it's, there is no sense of selection. It's absolutely formed from overpricing and we don't even suffer from it because we don't need that stuff. We have, our, we have completely our own access. And I think the India is a very good example that suddenly in India, I mean, people are starting to wonder, why do I want to buy all that stuff from India, me being an Indian, at these prices? Yeah. So people are starting to wonder what's happening. And I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not talking about gloom and doom. I'm not even talking about antagonism. We are adult enough to understand what's going on. And you have to be always aware why are things happening. When something is happening, make a quick analysis, a SWOT analysis, and you understand. And we all try. That's what I said in the beginning. Visual art is a container, and we all want to have a little bit of money extra. We all want to make a little game. That's if, what it is if, about. If I can just give one quick anecdote. Uh, we were in Bangkok a year ago, exactly. Uh, with the UBS MAP initiative, uh, having a workshop, like a three or four day workshop at the Jim Thompson House. And we had performing artists and artists and activists again from Bangladesh, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Vietnam, um, from Singapore. And they all sort of looked at each other and said, 
why the hell does it take the Guggenheim to get us together? Um, and they had actually a sense of profound gratitude, um, sort of disbelief, uh, but, uh, uh, but not resentment. Um, and they under, what they were afraid of is, is this a one night stand? When are you coming back? Um, but that was very moving to me because we do sort of have awareness of ourselves as something of a gorilla, unlike the Tate, the Guggenheim has a very mixed reputation in the world, um, which I don't think is deserved anymore. Um, we have, gee whiz. Um, but I, I, that, that, that sort of interaction conversation in Bangkok was very moving to me and made me realize that large institutions actually can do and can have a, uh, an Catalytic interesting effect role. on the local situation. Um, we, our time is short. Who are our wonderful question askers? Do we have microphones or are we now hogging the microphones? Could you please bring it over here? Sure. And if you would, uh, our session is being recorded, will be available on the wonderful World Wide Web. And if you could just mention who you are and if, you're, if you'd like, if you're with an institution, please share that as well. Hi, I'm uh, Paco Barragan, independent curator and arts writer. Um, I'm happy to hear about um, Chris' dramas. Be oh, what my drama? Yeah, because... Um, <laughs> it's so not a trauma, it's a drama. Yeah, drama, drama, <laughs> drama because uh, I know that I'm not the only one who's sent by US Customs always to the dog room, so it makes me feel happy. Okay, uh, two remarks. One on the Guggenheim. I think it's a very nice story you've been telling, but um, if we go and look at the Guggenheim Bilbao, it's a successful economical, from an economic point of view, but it doesn't engage in any way with uh, local audiences, uh, local narratives. Uh, I just saw a couple of uh, months ago two shows, the one on the Baroque, uh, Art at War, just uh, two prefabricated shows that doesn't engage in any sense. Also the idea of maybe the idea of engaging with local audiences if that means that every two years there is a local Basque artist show set up or something like that, I mean, that's not really, really interesting. So it's, for me, it's funny to hear about airport curating because the Guggenheim, that's what it does in Bilbao. So is there a question? In, in the no, room? a remark. Okay. Because okay. Uh, I don't... I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That model, I, that model is a previous model of the Guggenheim sort of global network. It was the first... I think many people and critics and people in the project would agree with you. There is some move that Richard Armstrong, uh, our director now, is trying to shift that. We have just hired for the first time a curator, Alvaro, um, uh, to you know try and, and create more programming. But I, I don't like to, disagree with you, but, but I would like it's to, not the model I'm talking about. But I would like to disagree, meaning me coming from Spain, I work in Bilbao running Sala Recalde for five years and everyone in the media was trying to play me against the Guggenheim. I have nothing against the Guggenheim. I think I was like the mushroom, they were the big tree and we collaborate. And actually it's also this local Spanish mentality, I must say, because I come from there, that <laughs> others need to do the job. I think, yes, they don't engage with the local community, so what? Let others engage with the local community. There's enough institutions. Why should the American institution engage with the locals if they don't want to? The question is, are there other institutions in Bilbao that may do that job? Yes. Do they want them alive? Yes, I vote for them. Museo de Bellas Artes, the second pinacotech of the uh, country called Spain still, is there. And uh, Sala Recalde is still open with 1,500 square meters. I think this is not a small Kunsthalle. Do the Guggenheim, if they want to do it, they, uh, they are willing to do it, fine. If they don't, there are other options. I mean, this idea of service providing of this, uh, of this uh, local engagement, plus it was great that they didn't. It was, I'm really thankful that they did not. It was really an amazing, super articulated community that the last thing they needed was the foreigner buying work from one and not the other, picking up uh, cherry trees, whatever you call it in English. So, no way. I want to jump in. What Alexandra is saying is very, very important. We have all trying to invent, since the 80s, new models. Magician Latter, the first stage of the Guggenheim, and you know what, the building of the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi is so interesting that they can completely forget about doing shows. You can do something completely different. Well, let's not so give up on that. Okay. Um, 
Another question, please. Sorry, uh, I have no, Actually, we do have to move on. I'm so yeah, sorry, but please, she, but they are all going to stay afterwards and you can have a discussion, but we need to raise another question. So, uh, there was somebody right here. I'm, uh, I'm Don Thompson. I'm just an economist. I'm not an art person. $12 million stuff shark? Yeah, I, I, yes, shark. Good to see you. I, uh, uh, Alexandra and Chris said something earlier, and, and that we let it go. Uh, Alexandra said, franchising is a wonderful idea, and it's worked well for us. And Chris said, hell no, never. Uh, I'd like to ask Alexandra three reasons why you will continue franchising, and Chris, three reasons why you would never do so. I really don't want this to be a referendum on the Guggenheim. We have the Guggenheim New York, which is our headquarters. We have one museum in Bilbao, which is still in an experimental stage. We have the Guggenheim Venice, which we inherited, and we're underway with Abu Dhabi. That is not a franchise. That is four museums. And they, I, 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 I go around the world and speak, and everyone says, when is the Guggenheim coming here? We need to move beyond that. The Guggenheim has changed a lot in the last 10 years. So I would encourage you to come to our exhibitions, read our catalogs, read our blogs, and understand that we have moved on and changed. The reason I said no is not a reaction to uh, the Guggenheim. It's simply because of um, a practical reality. I think what we need in many regions in the world is to try to understand what they understand with institution building. For instance, one big difference between us and them is that when you talk about art in West Africa, you cannot do without private foundations and private museums and private collections. And the same is true for India. In India, the National Gallery of Modern Art is becoming much better, but it's still very weak compared to the Foundation Devi of Le Capodar, compared to Karinadar. And so already there is a big difference. What, what does it mean public? What does it mean private in these different regions? Second, many actors and cultural agents in that region, they don't want institutions like we understand institutions. They want to create a form of institution which maybe doesn't exist yet. Hus has been saying years ago, instead of the hard place of the museum, as we know it, we have to think about soft places, which are much more like meeting places. You wonder that I still know that, right? So this softness, these soft meeting places, and to do something else, other disciplines, other forms of creating work, other forms of talking together and trying to see what you make and why that is as an example of the industrious revolution which is still going on because don't forget that capitalism is a good example of underdevelopment, not of development. So all these kind of things can come back and that's the reason why Tate is working together with local actors, very small initiatives, initiatives which are far away, maybe hidden in universities, and we try to come up with them about a definition of what is institution building. Because institution building is not creating a place. Institution building is creating structures. Structures which are sustainable. Because the very difference between what we are trying to do, and that's the reason why it's not fair to criticize Bilbao, what we are trying to do in difference from the market is we are creating long-term initiatives which are structures of memory. The market cannot do that. The market has to be short term, otherwise it's not a market. So that's the difference, and that's the reason why it's a very interesting parallel. And this long-term thinking, this trying to come up with what are different kinds of forms of memory structure, we are really good in that, I tell you. Absolutely good in that. Um, I love that. Uh, wait, wait, thank, thank you. Wow. Um, a lot of hands here. I do want to say to our, our, our wonderful speakers have all agreed to stick around a little bit. So I'm going to take two more questions. And we're going to finish, but we'll, we won't abandon you right away. So very quickly, please introduce yourself. And uh... Hi. Hi, my name is Skylar. I'm an artist and a student. And I wanted to thank you for everything you've said today. It's been very informative. As someone who is young and hopes to make an impact through the artwork that I will create someday. So my, uh, I wanted to focus in on what I have learned from listening and the word ecology, because I feel it has two senses. One is in the sciences, which means how things interact. And so we've been discussing how the museum, museums interact with the global world and locality. It also has a sense of equilibrium, sort of environmental sense. What is it that we're trying to maintain? So my question is, 
with a sense of vision, what is the responsibility of the local to the global and vice versa? That's beautifully put. As a moderator, I'd like to say that's such a well put, I thought, nice question. <laughs> any, any answers? Yeah, I think by not making any difference, it, be, it, it really depends on the scale. One needs to uh, differentiate different types of institutions, different typologies, and they also produce different methodologies of work. And I think that in my case, the most important part of the ecology is by starting understanding who is around you and who is around you in the sense of a primary audience and origin of the practice, which are the artists. So by visiting studios, by being in touch with the artistic community, by understanding from them the, the motivation of the work historically and also in the present, you you may understand better also who is your audiences, how they can be constituted and also uh, how can you work. So it's a, very, it's a very complex thing and I don't think that there is, uh, you know, there is no solutions, uh, but there is trials. And at, at least we need, to, we need to try. And we need to try and we need to produce new forms of elasticity. We need to invent. We cannot rely only. Can I say something very positive about the market? Okay. Well, it's about time, Chris. I think because, we because of what we have been saying, suddenly there is a place in the market and there is a deep interest to discover certain localities. Let mm -hmm. me give an example. There is a gallery of Madrid, Osma. And that gallery of Madrid is presenting work of Ivan Serpa, which are prints from the 60s, which <coughs> never had been on the market before because there was no market for it. Yeah. Now suddenly because of what we are trying to do with our deep, deep research in Latin American modernism, suddenly there is a place. And it's yeah. so much fun to walk on this art fair and to discover all that stuff. So thank you, market. Huh? Yeah. Thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so flexible and intuitive yeah, and I, fluid and dynamic yeah. are we that I, we're willing I, to I, contradict I promise, ourselves I, I on the same the, panel. the custom officer who gave me all that trouble to be positive this week. So. One more question. I'm so sorry. There was a question over there. Hi. Please say who you are. Yeah, my name is Alia Fatou. Uh, I work with Lombard Freed. Um, my question is about the segregation that we keep seeing in big institutions like the Guggenheim or... SF MoMA had a show about periphery and center and all of that. So why are we still seeing that as opposed to integrating the art from all over the world together, like seeing art for art as opposed to re regional you know, segregations? And because that also segregates your audience. And uh, cities like New York or London, they're so cosmopolitan. You have the, the international audience that would come to shows that are integrating art from all over the world and because I mean the connection between the artworks coming from these regions is not necessarily relevant so shows like the UBS show the sub sub um, continental whatever you know the artworks were only connected through the region the regional connection or you know that's not very interesting anymore so your I feel question like, is can um, we I, connect? I, again I mean uh, it's not <clears> just you know. I think they're not mutually exclusive at all. Uh, and as I've said early on, we really believe in scholarship. I, I want to avoid, again, the airport curating that just sort of assumes that these things can all float together because they have you know, some sort of formal relationship to each other or they were all produced by the same generation. That's an interesting approach. I think we need a methodology, that a curatorial methodology that can make shows like that really work visually, conceptually, art historically. I think Paul Schimmel's show, Painting the Void, did a fantastic job of that without sort of getting into the trap of, you know, a specific transnational model of art history. It just presented works from, a, including Gutai, in a sort of integrated art history that was about a particular moment around the idea of material. That was a great example. It takes a very good curator and a lot of research uh, to produce a show of that quality and that kind of persuasion. But they're not mutually exclusive. And remember that these shows, like Gutai or like Sai, are existing within the context of an international art museum. We're not presenting it at the Asia Society, presenting it at the Guggenheim. Uh, and I feel, unfortunately, there is an enormous amount of scholarship and research still to be done to educate our audiences about the, uh, uh, the stories, these 
multiple stories, these different viewpoints, these, these you know, other parts of the world, these differences that Chris is talking about. You can see them in their own context, but we're not limiting that context. You can see it in multiple contexts. They're not mutually exclusive. I think museums should be engaged in both. Don't we forget that uh, when we speak about modernities, we have to start really looking into a lexicon of all these different modernities. And when you establish a lexicon of all these different modernities, you will come up always with a problem, which is the double bind of these other modernities. A double bind, namely a responsibility towards its own modern development and a responsibility towards the development of the West, of the colonizer. So that double bind creates an incredibly interesting paradox. Now, what you're talking about, periphery and centralism, I think that's another stage which we went through. After Les Magiciens, we talked about centralism and the periphery. We are somewhere else. And what I like to stress right now is that we have to be a little bit more curious. To give you one example, you cannot talk seriously about modernism in India if you don't know about the history of modernist Indian architecture which was done by Khan, which was done with the Eameses, which was done with Dasharat Patel, you have to open up. You cannot talk about the world as it is today about that so-called globalism, which is just an expression of a surplus, a surplus which is secreted out of that interconnectedness. But you have to question yourself why you're interested in visual art, and probably you have to open up to other disciplines. Choose. Theater, cinema, architecture, and design. Choose. I I cannot agree more, but also we need to take into account that the world is also full of vernacularities, of paradigms that do not follow the modern paradigm. Yeah. And we need to include, I think, uh, to, for example, understand the collection of Museo del Barrio under a modern paradigm would be completely wrong. And it's really interesting that some art is produced under the agency of craft and under the agency of politics and social civil rights movements. Right. And this is something that you can localize not only in the city of New York, but in Asia, in, in all over. So it's very important to be very flexible in our minds and actually absorb different ways of explaining things that we have been explaining through one paradigm, even if we diversify it, as Chris is saying. Well, I, cannot, of, I cannot <laughs> await the exhibition at the Menil Collection in Houston which is going to be curated by Amar Kamba about civil rights protest movements all over the world, photography. Wow, this kind of exhibition 20, 30 years ago, we will not even have come up with. Yeah. And the market, of course, is going to follow because you're all going to buy vintage prints for 100 euro and a little photo book with this. That's great, you can become hunters again instead of having all these consultants telling you what to buy, please. Okay. It's a great time. So, Open up. Um, speaking of double binds, I have a single, <coughs> a single bind, which is I have to find a way to end this conversation. And I'll do it the usual way. By the way, we may not have all the solutions, and we may be not entirely consistent in everything we say, but we certainly do not lack passion for our topic. So um, I'd like to end, as I always do, on just bringing it down to the bare essence and asking each of you if there's one lesson that this audience should leave here with today before they get submerged into the market uh, whirlpool. What is that? And I'm going to start with Alexandra, and then Chris, and then Patrick, and then Chus. One, set, one lesson. I think what I've learned from today, not learned, but sort of reaffirmed, and some of these questions that I'm receiving kind of remind me, this is a process. We are engaged in a process. The UBS material that came in, many of those objects, Simran Gill, Mona Hatoum, uh, uh, Shilpa Gupta, are now residing in another show at the Guggenheim of contemporary recent acquisitions from all over the world. To answer your question, it's not just that one show, but it's how you activate that collection in a series of meanings, not a single meaning, but multiple meanings and into the future. This is all a process. The Bilbao is a process. It's not an additive project that we're engaged in. I don't think any of us want to engage in this sort of global uh, distribution, uh, this global curiosity, this new, we don't want to create a new canon. We want to interrogate the existing one, introduce, as you've kept saying, Thing, uh, Chris, intervene uh, with it by creating new and multiple platforms. It's not a monumental answer. We're just agents in a historical evolution, and museums are serving us, and we're serving museums as a uh, as a way to communicate what we think is happening now. 
dress. I would uh, like to invite you to wear an oversized T-shirt saying, I'm only interested in things I don't know yet. So it's a great time for collectors, right? Uh, Patrick. Yes, I, also in relation to the question, uh, I was thinking that uh, serious institutions, good institutions, some small institutions like we are, compared to Guggenheim, um, are building new narratives, different ways of different narratives. <coughs> and um, and in, with the example of Magician Dater, I remember because I was living in Paris when it happened in 89. Uh, in 89. Um, it was a big issue because it opened a, it was a, a new way of, of describing <coughs> cultural production at that moment. <coughs> and uh, But I, it, the, the reaction was so strong <coughs> The reaction was so strong, and it gave the opportunity to and it to still begin. Is a, it still is to, to begin a new process of. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. So, um, so when we talk about ex exclusion or, or, or these kind of issues, I think uh, I was very excited to see Moma's uh, show about abstraction because he gave, he gave a different, right. very different uh, history of how it, how it happened mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. Guggenheim's uh, uh, Kandinsky exhibition. Moma came out with this this other exhibition. So uh, I, I really, I'm very optimistic and really think that um, uh, when you have a group of, of curators and group of people working in an institution and you, bring this, you, you build this kind of new narratives, a lot of answers are, op are open. Thank you. Just Very short, I think the only thing that matters to me is to pay attention, to spend time, and to be true to art and artists. We are here because of them, and that's the most important thing. Well, on that wonderful note, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy.